If somebody will tend to Brother Leonard and make sure he's quiet during this, it would help a lot. 1 Corinthians 15. Brother Sam introduced Leonard out to some people in Gatlinburg. He said, uh, this is Brother Leonard. He said, this is Donnie's fall guy. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to 15. I don't need notes this morning. So what I thought we'd do is do things maybe just a tad bit different. Um, and we're going to kind of open up, and this is a resurrection chapter. And, and so if uh, you have a question or a comment, um, you know, we'll answer it. If you ask a question, what did Methuselah get for his 900th birthday? I'm going to dismiss it. I'm going to call your name out on camera and make you a laughing stock. <laughs> so we're talking about resurrection here, right? Uh, what I want to show about the resurrection is a lot of people this morning are preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know what I say to that? Amen. Yeah. That's what Paul said. He said, so we preach, also they, they, they preached. Right? There was proof that Jesus had raised from the dead. And when he said that, he was talking about Peter and his crowd. Peter preached the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right? Why did he preach it? He preached it that Christ would sit upon the vacant throne of his father David according to the flesh. That's why Peter preached the resurrection. We have a new kingdom hope. The king has been raised. The king of Israel, and he will sit up on that throne of, of his father David in the coming kingdom. Paul preached Christ raised from the dead as his gospel. Remember in 2 Timothy, remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. So, Peter's gospel was what? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Right? And he said, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing should come from the presence of the Lord. Your gospel is not how God one day is going to blot out your sins. Your gospel is that he's already taken care of that. Amen. Amen. Well, there's only one gospel in the Bible. We're going to destroy that this morning with the scripture. So go with me to 1 Corinthians and chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, starting at verse 1, I declare unto you, now notice here, a gospel. Not what it says, is it? The. He says the gospel. Which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. By which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. Unless you have believed in vain. Now we find out the vain belief here in 1 Corinthians 15 is that the sect of the Sadducees had come in and said there was no resurrection. Right? The Sadducees. I say it often. That's why they're sad, you see. Right? So then Paul says if you fail to believe that Christ raised again, then there's no salvation for you. You have taken something away from the gospel that is paramount, right? Him dying for your sins, the payment. Him being buried and God putting sin out of his sight is what God did with sin. Him raising him from the dead is the receipt of it all. That's God's assurance. That's the assurance that that was the Son of God who died on that cross to take care of the sin of the world. Amen. So now watch verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that He was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until this present. But some are falling asleep. Now watch. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Watch this one. At last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Hmm. I wonder where Paul saw him. Road to Damascus. 
right? One born out of due time. Right? The persecutions of Paul on the church was that Jerusalem. He was against them. He was hell bent, if you will, to put them asunder, right? And then God one day came down and met old Paul. It's amazing at the end of chapter 7 of Acts when the Holy Ghost through Stephen is reciting the history and the failures of Israel, how they killed the prophets, right? How they had crucified Christ. And now here they are rejecting the ministry of the Holy Ghost through Stephen. Right at the end of chapter 7, you hear the name Saul. You go on, you press on to chapter 8, and real early in chapter 8, you see the name Saul. You go on and get to number 9, and about 15, well, actually sooner than that, uh, first three verses there, I think it is, you see the name Saul. Wow. Something changed. When Saul was saved, when Paul was given this message, something changed in your Bible, and man has been running from it ever since. They will not accept the fact that God brought in a further revelation, a, progress, a progressive revelation, and delivered it unto Paul to give unto people like you and I. And it's the only thing that will make this book come together is when you receive it. So they say, resurrection, they all preached it. They preached the same gospel, they say. Paul was just carrying on what Peter and the boys had been preaching. Well, let's just go see if that's true or not. Turn your Bible over to book, the book of Luke. Book of Luke. I'm going to show you some foundational stuff. Now, you've seen a lot of this stuff over and over again, and I think redundancy is a great teacher. But I want you to see here in Luke in chapter 24, and I take Luke, we can see this in all four of the Gospels, but I take Luke because I like the way it's described in 24, 1 through 11. And it helps us to unhinge some of the bad doctrine that's out there about Paul preaching the same gospel that Peter and the others preached. Right? Do you know that Paul preached a different gospel than what Christ preached? Mm -hmm. yes. Right? Yep. The Bible says that Christ went about all the cities and synagogues and villages preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Right? Well, you know that Christ was doing that in the early part of the gospels. And that's what he gave the 12 to go preach. Right? Now, how many of us were taught back in our previous times that those guys were looking toward this cross? Well, let's find out if they were. Look at 24 and verse 1. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher. Now this is the women. And told all things unto the eleven and all to the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna. Now I can see there's some reason for doubt right there, but let's stay, let's stay with the context. Let's stay with the context. And Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. The apostles that Jesus Christ had commissioned to go out, and for three years they preached the gospel of the kingdom. These women just came back to the eleven. Judas is gone now. He had gone out and hung himself at the betrayal of Christ. So they come back to the eleven here. And they say, hey, Peter, James, John, hey, boys, look, the body of Christ is not in that tomb. He's raised. He's alive. And the apostles said, well, Mary, Joanna, did you not know that Jesus was going to the cross to die for the sins of the world? Are you so crazy as to know? That's not, no, 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 no. 
No, no. Folks, they have not been preaching Paul's gospel. They've been preaching the, the gospel of the kingdom. And watch in verse 11, and their words seemed to them. That was the 12 anointed apostles. It seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed not. Now I can take you back to Matthew 16. And he said unto Peter, because Peter answered correctly, who do men say that I am? Yeah, Elias, so on and so on. Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Huh. Thou have answered well, son of Barjona. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. So what was Peter revealed? That Jesus was the promised one. He was the Messiah. Well, he knew that Jesus was going to die and be buried and raised again. We'll read the verse 11 again. Right? So let me ask you a question, folks. Could the 12, in the three years that they were with Christ, in and out of that ministry with him, could they have been preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? No. You don't need to put that under anybody's nose that has a degree, who went to a seminary, who graduated eight years of college and still don't know anything about his Bible. You don't have to run that by him. There's no way that these men are preaching how that Christ was going to die for anybody's sin and be buried and rose again. Watch Peter down here in verse 12. Then arose Peter and he ran into the sepulchre. And stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves in the parting, wondering himself, at which was come to pass. Wow. Now people say that the tomb was empty, but it wasn't. It had those clothes in it. Now the story was that somebody had stole the body. Now I wonder if Peter said, now John, let's think about this. If they stole the body, why would they go through the trouble of unwrapping it and leaving all these clothes here? Wouldn't they just have stole the body? God left them clothes to prove unto them there was a resurrected Jesus. Amen? He didn't need them. Amen? That's, right. that's what's going to happen to you one day. You might like Levi's. It might be Calvin Klein. Whatever it is, you ain't going to need them. One day he's going to resurrect you out of this old mess. He ain't taking carnal blue jeans to heaven with him. Amen? So these guys here go down and they're confused as all get out about why in the world is Jesus not in that tomb and what has happened? Well, they're preaching the cross. No, they haven't been preaching the cross. They've been preaching the kingdom. How that Jesus Christ was going to come. He was going to set up a kingdom and earth and all those that believed on his name and followed his teachings. We're going to be the ones that go into that kingdom. Write this down in your mind or in a book. The issue in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is not about believing that Jesus Christ was dying for sins and been buried and raised again there. The issue in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is to believe on his name. And I'm going to show you that in Scripture. Go back to chapter 18 with me and we'll see why they were so perplexed. You know, if I were to title this, I might say, what a glorious surprise. It was a surprise to them that he raised. It's glory to us that he raised, right? Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not surprised I've got the book. Now, I'm not in the time that they were in. That wasn't me in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So they're being complex, their, their, their confusion, their lack of understanding. And I believe he explains it to you in Matthew, or not Matthew, but Luke chapter 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And all that are written in the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. You can read that in Psalm 22. Zechariah speaks of it. Isaiah speaks of it. The prophets wrote about Christ's suffering. Might I get you to understand something this morning? If you're going to understand the books of Hebrews through Revelation, you're going to need to understand what Peter eventually understood was the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Right? The sufferings of Israel and the glory that should follow. That's going to unhinge those books for you to understand Hebrews through Revelation. In verse 32, For he, speaking of Jesus, shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on. And they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Right there it is, Jesus tells them. And they, the twelve apostles, understood none of these things. See it? And this saying was hid from them. 
Neither knew they the things which were spoken. Amen. If they were preaching the cross back here, that would contradict 1831 and 32, 33, and 34. They understood none of these things. If they'd have understood that Jesus was dying for their sins and was going to be buried and raised again for their justification, they all would have gone to the tomb that day and held a sunrise Easter service. <laughs> yeah, but they didn't. Now what I've learned, folks, and, I, and I'm not just here to pick on people, but what I've learned is when it comes this time of year, men go in here and they preach the tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. The tomb is not only empty, the Son of Man has gone back to glory. Amen. And the Son of Man reappeared to one as if it were out of due time, and he gave unto him the revelation of the mystery. And through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, him going back to glory and returning unto one Saul, who he saved, also Paul, we have information about the resurrection and understanding about the resurrection that they never had. Even Peter, when you go over and read in 2 Peter, he said, if you really want to understand these things, I'm paraphrasing, you got to go back to Paul. Because he writes a lot of stuff that's hard to understand. Right? So Peter would direct them to Paul if they want to know God's long suffering. And that's really what uh, Peter was alluding to. Peter was being mocked. Hey man, where's this Christ that's supposed to come back? What's going on with that? Peter said, hey, you can write it down, brother. He's coming back. But he said, look, I've learned something. If you want to know why he hadn't come back yet, if you want to know why he didn't come back in early Acts, you got to go to Paul because Paul talks about the long suffering of God. And Paul also writes things that are hard to understand. This is Peter, the apostle. And we pick on people who today are not apostles, but it's hard to understand Paul, isn't it? Well, it is until you believe what God has done about the separation of both Israel and the body. So this resurrection, they didn't know of it. They went down and the body is gone. And then there's people who are bargaining with people that they would not tell it that he had raised. But I'll give you money if you'll just say somebody stole the body. I was watching a thing on YouTube, and there's a guy going through the streets, and he was offering up this pamphlet, not this one, but a pamphlet, and he was like, hey, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And this one guy said, no, he died. Huh? He don't believe in him, he died. He walks up to another one, he says, you believe in Jesus Christ? He said, I don't need him. He walked up to Jesus, he said, you believe in Jesus Christ? He said, no, that's fake. You believe in Jesus Christ? No, I'm not a kid. You see, well, that happened in a foreign country. Now, this guy was walking the streets of America, right? Where Jesus Christ has been preached that he raised again from the dead, right? So people in confusion about Jesus Christ and the life of Jesus Christ, the death of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Christ going back to glory, but Christ returning to give Paul the revelation of the mystery where we can go and see the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can go see the cross of Jesus Christ. We can see it in a light that they never had. Right? Because it was progressive revelation not known unto them. They're fine right where they are. Right? Their belief had to be that Jesus was the Messiah. John chapter 3. I'm going to read the most popular verse in all the Bible for all people who say they're preaching the gospel. I'm going to show you what John 3 really means by the scripture. Not my feelings about the verse. All right? So go to 3 and 16. This will knock MacArthur off his seat here. For God so loved the world. Right? That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's the gospel. Don't read anymore. No. Look at verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. Don't quit reading. Read verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he had not believed what? In the name. In the name of the only begotten Son. That's the issue in John. 
Well, John 3.16 is about the cross. No. John 3.16 is about God giving His only begotten Son to a nation who rejected Him. You can call it the cross, whatever you want to do there. But listen, He was given to Israel that if Israel had received their Messiah, they had received Him as being the Son of God, they would have gone into belief and faith. They would have been a city up on a hill. They would have been a light into the world. Does that sound familiar? We draw it every week on the board. They would have been a kingdom of priests and kings over there. And they would have been the light to the world that the world could have come to God through them. Amen. Amen. By believing on his name. Well, that didn't happen. Go up at John 20. Hey. Mm -hmm. And in that time, there is that just correlating to the world, the Israelites, the, the Jews? No, that, that was a world. The, the world was the world. Israel had the message of God. For the world to get it, they had to come up through Israel. So believing Israel would have been a light to the world that the world could. Isaiah chapter 2 is exactly what happens. Right? When they go into their kingdom glory, there'll be a light unto the world, and the Gentiles will come to the light of their rising. So that failed to happen. What happened instead, they reject the prophets, they reject the Son, they reject the Holy Ghost, they fall, and salvation came unto the Gentiles through their fall, not through their rise. Right? So here in John, if you will, turn and look at John 4, before we go to 20. The same preacher that will quote John 3.16 as your gospel will never show you this verse. Look at John 4.22. Ye worship. You know, what, you know not what you worship. Let me start all over. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. The Jews were in place for the salvation of the Lord. And through the Jews being the priesthood unto God, the world could come to, the Gentile people could come up to God through that channel, right? They were the people of blessing. They were the head and not the tail. You don't have such a thing going on right now. They fell through their fall. Salvation is gone until the free world without them. Amen? And even they have to believe the same thing you believe today to be saved. And that is the finished cross work of Jesus Christ. Well, if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you're not going to believe in the cross, right? So when Paul went into the synagogues in the early part of his ministry, the first thing he, he settled was that Jesus was the Christ. Because a Jew was never going to believe that that was the Messiah that died on that cross if they did not believe he was the Messiah. Right? And so here, salvations of the Jews, the world was the whole world, but the world had to come and get it through Israel's blessings. Right? Not so now. Right? Now go to John 20. When you get to John 20, look at verse 27. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Tom, Thomas answered unto him, My Lord and my God. See that? Well, Thomas had to see something, didn't he? Yep. Thomas was doubting. Yep. Thomas was one of them, yep. wasn't he? Yep. Wasn't he one of those people? Wasn't he one of those, like Peter and James and all those guys? Jeez, Thomas, you don't believe Jesus raised again the third day? Thomas had believed on a name, but he felt as if the king of glory that they had followed had been done away with. And I'm only going to believe if I can touch him. Right? Good luck with that today, right? 29. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is what? The Son of God. And by believing you might have what? 
It's all about the name of Christ for them back there. They had to believe that he was the Messiah. They had to believe that he was the promised one. And by believing that, they would follow him and his teaching and to their kingdom hope. Amen? Now, Paul tells you assuredly that Jesus is the Son of God. Right? But Paul goes into a gospel that he received of Christ that gives you more detail about what happened back there according to the scriptures. How that Christ died not just for the sins of Israel's new covenant to, to blot out their sins, but he's showing you how God died for all men's sin without a covenant to those of us who were cast off Gentiles. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. I heard this said, now, now one thing you will find out when people try to debunk what it is that we teach according to the dispensational Bible study that we do, they stand up and they are absolutely comfortable by telling lies. I've, I've noticed that. Well, they say this and like God's got an emergency plan. Nobody in this room, you listen to me, I've never said God had to come up with plan B so that he could do this. God tells you himself in scripture, if people just read it, it was before the world was. Right? That's what the scripture tells us. And not only was it before the world was, but it was unto our glory. See that? This ain't a make-up plan. God's not in trouble. God didn't have to sit down with the Holy Trinity and go, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Israel fell. Oh, oh, I got a problem. Oh, come on, man. The Bible's written, God before the world was, he knew he was going to reconcile heaven with the body of Christ, and he knew he was going to reconcile earth through the prophecy program of Israel. Therefore, both heaven and earth reconciled unto God. Amen. And all things were under the sun. His son, all things were created by him, for him, whether it be thrones or principalities or powers, it doesn't matter what it is, he's just leaning it out right now to a bunch of heathen. But he's going to take it all back. Amen? And Matthew, he said, I have all power in heaven and earth. He has not exercised all power in heaven and earth. You can go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, the God of this world hath blinded them who believe not. Amen? So look here in Ephesians in chapter 2. God doesn't have a problem. God's got a plan. And it doesn't matter what anybody says about it. How many times you put on a suit, polish your best shoes, and stand up with a Bible, you can't change God's plan. That's right. And you can't make God do something that God's not doing. That's why you need to know exactly what God is doing. Amen. You know why people don't get healed by preachers at the hospital? Because then people are really sick. They're not faking it. Right? That's how they get healed at the Colosseum. They're faking it. Right? Lay hands on me. I'm healed! You know where nothing was wrong with you to start with. You went there and got paid to be a fool. And you're willing to do it. Amen. Why you sell a ticket? That's about money, isn't it? You, you, you can get healed at the Coliseum if you buy a ticket, but you can't get healed at the hospital without a ticket. I don't think Jesus works that way. I don't think he worked that way in the Gospels. Thou son of David, I need a healing. How much money you got? He never did that, did he? Well, why do we let monkeys like that get away with that stuff without calling them out? Well, you... A little harsh this morning, Donnie. No, it's going by the scripture, man. If it, a clown's a clown. Look at 211. That's not very gracious. Folks, listen. Grace does not mean always passive. Grace don't mean you don't speak your mind at times. Right? Well, if we take these people that don't want to call it out, don't want to make it what it ought to be and say, look here, man, these guys have got you hoodwinked and none of us would ever learn anything. Right? Well, I'm sorry it makes your favorite pastor a clown. It made me a clown one time. You know what this book has made me so mad? Has it ever slapped you in the mouth? Man, that's been like a right hand hook to me many times. You know what I do? I quit reading it. I quit studying it. No. I realize it just spoke to me. They called me what I was. 
This is what it'll do for you. Look here at 211. Wherefore remember that ye been in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hand. So back here in time past Jeff puts it on the board a lot. I used to. But back here in time past and even up here where you got Peter and them boys in early Acts there was two groups of people. You had the circumcised and you had the uncircumcised. Right? And this up here was the blessed Israel. And this here was the far off Gentiles. Now which one do you think you belong to? He get ready to tell you. Right here. That at that time you were without Christ. Bad place to be, isn't it? Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You know what an alien is, right? You were alienated. And strangers from the covenants of promise. Having no hope and without God in the world. You know where your hope came from? When God saved this man right here. And he gave unto him the revelation of mystery and the dispensation of the grace of God and the teachings of the cross. How Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day for our justification. And all that we have to do is believe it and receive it by faith. Trust him and nothing other than him. Amen. That's when your hope came. Right? Look at verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You're made nigh by the blood of a covenant. No, it's not what he says. You're made nigh by the blood of Christ. Some people say, well, it had to be the blood of the New Testament because that's the only blood that was shed. That, that is just absolutely not thinking about what happened on the cross. When Christ died on that cross for the sin of the world, folks, he shed his blood not just for a testament people. It reached out to people who had no covenant, no hope, no promise. You see that? It accomplished two things. Well, the covenant was always back there. Go read it. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Hebrews chapter 8. He's showing you how the blood brought in a group of people who were not a people in time past. The uncircumcised Gentile. Wow, that cross gets stronger and stronger by the second, man. Now listen, I told these guys outside. There's people who want to go very deep in the scripture. We're going to get down and deep in the scripture and never get deep in the cross. Never really get down to what all we'd accomplish, but they're going to show you something new. Boy, I've got out my rag, and I'm going to tell you what, boy, Jeff, I'm, I'm doing some polishing this morning. Boy, I'm going to get y'all something pretty to look at. Just open your Bible, and I'm going to show y'all something you ain't never seen before. That is the goal of man. I have no such goal. I want to go so deep in that cross, it lives in your chest, it lives in your mind. It's everything. You don't detach yourself from it. You don't add anything to it. It's all you got, and it's all you need. Amen. That's where I want you to be. If you get there, then glory be to God. It wasn't because of me. It was because of Him. Yeah. If you don't get there, shame on you. Just keep on holding on to the side rails. They throw, I was telling these guys, they throw out that word. You got to have a good balance. What does that mean? If God's reconciled the world unto himself, he took care of the balance. All you need to do is be reconciled unto God. Am I right? Uh, you know what they mean by that balance? You can hold on to a little bit of Israel and a little bit of grace. All right? That's what that really means. Just don't throw out some of my pet doctrines that I grew up on. Look, folks, I don't want any of my pet doctrines that I grew up on. I got sick and tired of my pet doctrines. What I want, I want to be saturated in that cross work of Jesus Christ. I want that to mean everything he said it is to me. I'm crucified. My flesh is crucified. The old me is crucified. I'm risen with Christ. I'm seated with Christ. I'm in Christ. I'm sealed in Christ. And there's nothing that the devil can do about it or myself. That's where I want to live. Amen. Why about you? Yeah. People are so afraid of that grace, man. You've got to watch out. Listen, I understand and I feel sorry for them because I was in the same snare at one point. You're in a snare, man. And what happens is when somebody talks like this, they, they just put it all in Jesus. They get scared because they think, man, if I'm not doing something, I may not really be there. And they're afraid of your liberty. They're afraid of your grace. Guess what? Some believers are afraid of their own liberty and the grace. Right? Oh, I'm so afraid I'd be, God would be so mad at me if I did that. Man, 
you have never let God down. You know why? God never had faith in you. God put his faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. He knew. He knew. <laughs> about said a, not a bad word, but about said a wrong word. He knew how horrible you were when he saved you. Right? God got no expectation for you to do anything to impress him. Drop it. Get out of it. God wants you hugging that cross work of Christ. That's what he wants, man. It's, he put him there for you. You can't leave it. You can't get away from it. You understand where I'm coming from? That's what the resurrection means to me. It's a resurrected life with Christ Jesus. In Him eternally. Amen. Golly. That's enough to make you speak in tongues. If I knew Him, I would. So this, uh, what you just read, uh, verse 12, about uh, Jesus saying, Behold, I make all things they're still in this uh, verse right here as far as being alien, you're aliens. Well, the alienated in your own mind, yeah, according to what God and according to our deeds and that. But when he's talking about alienated there, he was saying that we did not have a part of Israel's covenants and promises. That's the alienation that he's talking about there. We were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. See, back here, Israel was God's chosen people in the earth. And they had the status of being risen and being the head and not the tail. We didn't have any part of that. Right. So what I'm saying is, this is where these folks are still today that are not saved. They're still alienated. They're alienated in their minds, but there's not an Israel to be alienated from. Right? So there's not an Israel today for them to be alienated from. They have fallen. Okay? So there's not something that we join into them and get their blessings which are futuristic over here in the kingdom, that's still a promise to them. What God has revealed through Paul is that Israel's been set aside and this one new man is being built here. What God is forming is the one new man. And there are people that are lost here. They're alienated in their thoughts and in, in their ways toward God, but they're not alienated toward Israel because there's no Israel to be alienated from. We're all one, and he's concluded us all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon us all. Right? So the alienation, you're right. There, there is an alienation of the mind that we're not hearing God, not believing God, and not taking God for his word. Right? So go to Colossians. We're going to try to finish up on Colossians here uh, so you can go home and do what you got to do. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to show the power of God and His purpose for heaven and earth and how you and I fit into the purpose of God and the will of God. You know, I was always taught growing up that God's got this big cosmic plan for my life. And I just have to determine what it is because that's the will of God. And I'm constantly thinking, where is it at? Well, if God wants me doing that, then why don't he tell me? Right? And so I realized down the road that became superstitious. God hasn't built this great big old plan for your life. And he's not directing all your footsteps toward that plan. Right? You got me? God has built you with a free will to serve him, to love him, to know him, to have his knowledge, and to have his wisdom according to the scriptures. And when you come to the scriptures, you're going to find out it's not having the knowledge of Donnie. It's not having the knowledge of my will. It's all about Jesus Christ. It's to have the knowledge of him and wisdom, hidden wisdom, manifold wisdom, to understand what God is doing today what God did in time past and what God's going to do in time future is what the Bible is all about. The Bible never becomes about you and about me at any point. That's what man has done with it. He's taken a humanistic point of view about the Bible and how I am going to get all this stuff because I am pleasing God. No. Jesus Christ pleased the Father. And the Bible says that it was pleasing to the Father that all the Godhead dwell in Him bodily that pleased God. 
So the pleasing of God is over. What's pleasing to God now is you take Him for His Word when He shows you what His Son has done for the entire world without distinction. All men can be saved and then come to the knowledge of truth. There's the will of God. So I'm no longer chasing a will. Should I work at McDonald's or should I work for a tow company? God only knows because somewhere in time past He had me working for such and such company. That's, that's what they want you to think. It's never about you. Can I get you to believe that? This book is not about you. It's about Jesus Christ, the creator of all things, who created all things by him, for him. It doesn't matter what it is. He's God Almighty in the flesh, and it's about him. It's not about you. When you get you out of the way and believe all that this is about Christ, and what God is doing to reconcile both heaven and earth back to himself, you can now come to the knowledge of the truth. Amen? As long as you want to stay back and think about, it's Easter, what color should I wear? It's going to be Pentecost, we'll all wear red. As long as you're thinking this book is about you, you're in the high weeds. Amen? I'm not trying to be mean about that, it's just not about you. It's about God and what he's doing. To save people like us. So go to Colossians in chapter 2. And look at verse 8. Thank you. That's right. I'm glad it's not about me. Right? I'm glad salvation is not about me. I'm glad justification is not about me. I'm glad that God Almighty didn't look down and say, Donnie, i got a good plan for you. I'm going to give you my salvation. And what I need you to do is take care of it. He never did it. That's what's being preached. He never did it. He gave his salvation in the person of his son. Right? So that his son could freely give it to us because he knew we would have screwed it up ten minutes after we had it. You about to hurt my feelings. 2.8 Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of this world and not after what? It seems like a book about Christ to me. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Sounds like it's about him. Yep. Verse 10. And ye are complete in him. <laughs> wow. Not one thing outside of Jesus Christ do I need. Don't that make you feel good? Yes. Oh man, when they're out here doing all this work, you know. Yeah. Ah, man, we had a mouse one time. My wife and I come in here, and in the ladies' room, he was into one of the toilets and drowned. I said, well, bless his heart. If he'd have read Paul's epistles, he'd know water wasn't necessary. <laughs> he'd still be with us today. Little fella had to get baptized, and it cost him his life. Yeah. Right? She, said, she was like, she's like, whoa, come here, come here, come here. I said, well, he's dead at 4 o'clock. What are you worried about? He's probably been in there since last Sunday. And I don't know that we taught Ephesians 4 that day, but if he'd have heard it, he'd have been right. Anybody seen that meme of that guy standing up into the stands of a football game? He's got this real concerned look on his face. And they said, hey, that's the guy the day before he read the book of Galatians about being circumcised. <laughs> If, he, if, he, if he'd have known it, he wouldn't have done it. He wouldn't have had that look on his face. Come on, let's just go here and finish this off, my foolishness. Verse 11, In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That's not something you did. That's what Christ did right here at the cross. Jesus Christ went to the cross in the form of sinful flesh, right? God took and buried him in that sinful flesh out of his sight. That body was corrupt. God had charged his sin to it. He had made him become sin. When he raised him, he did not raise him in that flesh. You know how I know that? Because he transformed himself from time to time where they did not recognize him. When he went into Thomas, he didn't use the doorknob. Right? He walked right on in. He didn't raise him in his simple flesh. Do you know what the resurrection is teaching you right now? 
That God Almighty, when you die, He's going to sow you in that body of flesh of sin into the dirt. But when He raises you, He's going to raise you and give you a body like unto His glorious body. That's what the resurrection is teaching you. Right? Who's looking forward to that? All right? The circumcision of the flesh there is not a circumcision of the heart that some preach. It says it's a circumcision of the flesh. What was the circumcision of the flesh? Jesus Christ cut off from the flesh of Adam was raised in not sinful flesh, raised in glorious flesh. Amen? You get it? So he cut the sin of Adam away. And you've been circumcised the same way if you've believed. All right? In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He did that at the cross. Buried with him in baptism. The little mouse went the wrong way with that. Buried with him in baptism is spiritual. He baptized us into this death. Right? He baptized us into that death. We're identified as in the death of Christ. You got it? What did he do, Willie? He took Willie, when he took Adam to that cross, he took Willie to that cross. Ad, uh, Willie was a, a son of Adam, just like the rest of us. So don't look at Willie weird, right? So he took Willie to that cross when he took Adam to that cross. He crucified old Willie, right? Buried Willie, planted him into that death. But Willie believed something, and God Almighty raised Willie up. Amen. Now, you know that's spiritual because Willie's sitting right there. Right? And he seated him up here in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know that's spiritual because Willie's sitting right there. You know what? Willie ain't called up to his spiritual sense yet, right? He's still down here in this body of flesh. When that body of flesh is done away with once and for all, he's going to go up and be joined to what God has done for him in that new man. And he's not going to be in sinful flesh. Amen. Amen. And you know what God's done with that flesh? He's buried it. He's put it away, man. All right? Look here in closing this morning. Bear with him in baptism where also you are risen with him. Now watch this. It wasn't Willie's operation that did this. An operation happened, but it wasn't Willie that did it. By the faith of the operation of God who have raised him from the dead. You know what he's done with Willie? He's raised him from the dead. If you haven't believed the gospel, you're dead. You know what you need? You need life. You know where that life comes from? Jesus Christ. All right? And you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, have he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way now to his cross. Why were the handwritings and ordinances contrary to you? Because they never were given to you. Right? They were given to Israel. And guess what? Israel failed. And God said, Jesus Christ met the requirements of the law. He met the requirements of God's standard. He met the requirements of God's justification so he could nail the law to the cross. Right? And therefore, you can't be judged by the law because you're not under the law. You're under grace and you're in Christ. Amen. Chapter 3 in closing. Verse 1, if you then be risen with Christ, how many in here can honestly walk out of this room and say, I've been risen with Christ? Amen. If you have believed the gospel and trusted Christ, you're risen with Christ. You not will be risen with Christ. You are judicially and spiritually speaking in Christ right now. And that's why, by the way, he can call you an ambassador because you're not where you ought to be. Right? You're in a foreign territory. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now, you ought to be looking for your God and Savior, Jesus Christ, to come and get you. Right? But at the time that you're here, we ought to be doing what we're doing this morning, trying to show other people what Christ has done for them through His resurrection. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. Do you understand it? Do you understand how God can justify sinners? God doesn't justify sin. He justifies sinners. 
He'll never justify sin. He'll never sit and say, that's okay. That's okay. He'll never do that. But what God cannot do, and that Christ met the requirements to be made sin for us, He can't charge you with your sin, having charged Christ with the sin of the world. God Almighty has set you free from that. Right. Amen? Amen? I hope you see there's more in the resurrection than just going down and finding the tomb empty. It's to also know Jesus Christ according to the revelation of mystery. Right? Very few know. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful for the grace of God, the mercy of God, the peace of God. We're so thankful for the cross of Christ, His blood, what He accomplished by Himself when He died there to save sinners. You raised Him again the third day into justification of life, and we give You, only You, only You, all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. We trust no man. We believe in You. We trust Your Word. We take it for the truth. We live it. We have it, and we're going to hold on to it. Dear God, your grace and your mercy and your peace, I live in it daily, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Nobody said, Amen. Amen.